Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode at The Inner Changemaker. And this week, we are diving into a topic that we have not covered too in depth, but I think I found the perfect guy to be able to dive into the topic of money and wealth building for business owners and entrepreneurs. Um, my guest is the chief wealth architect at his company called Wealth Factory. He's also the author of the New York Times bestseller, I love the name of this book, Killing Sacred Cows. Uh, he also wrote a book called What Would the Rockefellers Do? We're gonna talk a little more about that because I'm curious in terms of what would the Rockefellers do in a modern day world. Uh, this man has been featured from anywhere from ABC to um, you know some of the largest publications around the world, and I know he speaks on this exact topic all around the world. Uh, so welcome to the show, Mr. Garrett Gunderson. Yeah, that's actually pretty true now, the around the world thing, because for a long time it was just US and Canada, but this summer I spent a, cu a couple months in Italy and, uh, yeah. and speaking out in Italy, so yeah, I've actually now spoken uh, around the world and uh, I guess also if you include that I taught English for three months when I was 18 right. in Korea. I went to Korea and spent the summer there. So I guess we could include that too. But most of my advice primarily <laughs> is heard by the U.S. and Canadian citizens um, when it's in person and then online, definitely all over the place like U.K. and Australia. We have a, a decent following there. Yeah, I mean, now, now, now we can call it the international, Garrett Gunderson, the international speaker. Right. Yeah. Um, I know when we originally tried to connect on this interview, you were in Italy, um, which was kind of funny because like uh, I also spent a couple weeks in Italy. My girlfriend's from there. So, you know, we're always out there at least, you know, maybe during the holidays, sometimes during the summer where it's, it's a little nicer, obviously. So it's good to hear that you, this message of yours um, in terms of helping people kind of think differently about their finances and wealth um, is actually spreading throughout the world. So that's that's really awesome. Um, maybe give us a little more context. I know I kind of read through a little bit of some of the accomplishments that you've you know you've had, and anybody who does a quick Google search on you have seen you you know in other interviews, whether it's um, you know the the author of Rich Dad and Poor Dad or Mr. Joe Polish. Like we, we've seen you around, and we we know that you have those relationships there. But how did someone like yourself? growing up get to kind of where you're at now in terms of advising business owners and the way that they should think about wealth like how, how did they, walk us through a little bit of that that journey for you part of it was that uh, I learned quickly because I admitted my mistakes a lot of people have a hard time questioning when things go wrong and they defend their decisions even when it wasn't the best decision in the world so I've had this curiosity from the time I was young of what would it take to be wealthy what is it like to be wealthy, who is a, is wealthy out there? And I just had this kind of like little memo pad and I'd always ask these questions. I'd go to people that I knew were more successful than me from the time yeah. I was 15 years old, but I did launch a business when I was 15, just detailing cars in a small coal mining town. I won $5,000 for being the young entrepreneur of the year for that state. And I wanted to invest that money to get out of the small town, to get to the thriving metropolis of Salt Lake City, which at the time seemed like a big city to me. And, uh, and that was kind of the initial path. And in looking to invest that money, I got offered an internship, which was really just a disguise of me bringing in my family and friends to be peddled products like mutual funds and life insurance. But it was still my beginning kind of framework to get started. And at first it was going really well because it was the 90s and the market was just going up. But then in the year 2000, the market started to turn and start to go down. And that's when my real education began because that's when I had to have a really tough look in the mirror and say like, what am I going to tell these people? Am I going to tell them the same cliched crap that everybody else is saying? Or am I going to face and really figure out what's going on? And fortunately, I had some good mentors and people I had access to at an early age that I was able to get everybody out of the market in the year 2000, have gains in 2001 and 2002 when everybody else was losing money. And then I really just went on this quest to figure out like what's guaranteed in the world of finance. And I found there were, there were four things that were pretty guaranteed, even though you're not allowed to use that word. The first one is if you can save tax, that's a pretty guaranteed return. If you can save interest, that's a guaranteed return. If you can save on insurance expenses by structuring it properly, that's a guaranteed return. And if you can find underperforming assets or hidden fees or commissions and put that back in your life, that's a guaranteed return. So I became fascinated with kind of that thought process. And at an early age, I was like, I want to become economically independent so that my income isn't dependent upon the advice that I get. I'm a shining example to people 
and they would go like, how did you do it? And I got my ass kicked figuring that out because I owned a bunch of real estate and some was good, some was bad. I owned oil and gas, I owned IPOs, I owned a hard money lending fund. I, you know, so I, I, I really went down this like diversified route of just learning everything that I could about too many things, which meant that I could never really master or become an expert at any one given thing. And I was doing things that I didn't love or enjoy in the name of making money. And I don't think that we always get to do things that we love and the money will just automatically follow because there's certain times where it's just a hobby and it doesn't, like I'm doing stand-up comedy, I'm not getting paid to do it right now, it's just a fun hobby. And yes, there are people that make a lot of money in stand-up comedy, but they're probably out three, four nights a week, they're, they're thinking about every day. Yeah. That isn't transformational for me. The world of finance is transformational and really helping people take back control over their financial life, understand money at a deeper level, realize that they're their greatest asset. And if they invest in themselves through the proper ideas and relationships, they can have an, a better advantage than just handing their money over, buying, holding, and praying that 30 years from now, it's all going to work out. And I'm here to give people more permission to succeed, not feeling guilty that they didn't invest early enough or that they're not always investing or that, you know, feeling bad when the market goes down, but instead having a better understanding that if we really focus instead of diversity, and we build a foundation in the proper safety measures, then you can have better returns and a much better life because you don't get your mindset in the drain if things don't work out according to plan. And when you get economically independent, you have so much more power because if things don't go according to plan, you're not losing a home. You're not losing your cars. You're not worried about putting food on the table, which allows you to continue to be you know, constructive during really difficult times and creative during times where everybody else is just in absolute scarcity because scarcity is what really destroys wealth more than anything and unfortunately i think a lot of our financial philosophies have been predicated upon scarcity and that's why people are swaying philosophically based upon fear or greed and not necessarily on principles and sustainability mm. Mm. i love that there's actually there's so actually much, so much of what, of you, what said you said that I, I i really really loved and i wanted to actually you know find a way to dive into um but before we do i mean what is I, i'm really curious what is this thing of all these successful entrepreneurs that i know whether in my network or just outside of my network of doing stand-up comedy um in a couple of weeks i'm flying to uh new york um and a friend of mine is interviewing um you probably know james altiger yeah, he's doing stand up and uh, bought it. I guess he has interest in a comedy club now that he bought into. Yeah, like it's the so the event is like they're doing the interview, so kind of like standard, you know, entrepreneurial type of like interview, you know, live audience, which is really cool. And and then right after, he's just doing stand up. And I was like, oh, I didn't know James was doing stand up. I mean, it seems like you know, funny guy. So that's kind of a a, a funny. Well I'm trying to communicate a message that's normally dry, drab, and pretty boring Yeah. in the world of money and finance, and I feel like I'm pretty effective at it. To get even more effective at it, I like to stretch myself and do something that scares me a little bit, which was stand-up comedy, and it's just a good creative outlet to, be, to have fun. Um, so not only am I delivering better and cr bringing a little bit of a fun and simplicity to that complex topic of finance, but I'm also kind of enjoying life a little bit. Uh, I just started doing it August of 2017 and I have two more gigs booked and I've done three more since my, my first one and, and no longer is it just open mic, I'm actually opening for actual comedians which is kind of fun. Whoa, I mean that's 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 pretty cool. We're gonna have to link to maybe some videos or you know some some insta you know some lives or something of you doing you know some comedy because that's that's pretty you know hilarious. Um, you know talking about the topic of of money, wealth building. I mean, I think sometimes like I, I, I always like, kind of like survey my, my list and people within that listen to the show that watch the show. Like, why do you think that money, it, it kind of comes across as like a taboo topic, you know, when, whenever you kind of, I don't know if you ever get that sense, maybe not with the clients that you work with since they have, you know, they have businesses and like they're, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're bought into the idea that they're over, you know, they're achievers and they're going to go make more money. Um, like, like, and, and you kind of touched on it a little, a lot of it is kind of predicated on this type of fear and, and the scarcity mindset that's in the world. But why is like, how do you view money and how do you try to get people to kind of look at money so that they kind of have a healthier conversation rather than looking at this as a, as a taboo topic? I look as, at money as a byproduct. It's a byproduct of value creation. So in the world of cause and effect, value creation 
is really the cause and money is the effect, or more simply stated, dollars follow value. So yeah. if we're trying to study and understand money, we're only looking at the effect. It's more powerful to really dive into value creation because it's a more complicated topic than most people think. Because value is perspective, and that perspective is in the eye of the beholder. So if we could really figure out what we contribute to the world, and we can contribute to more people through reach, or through impact by getting deeper with our impact with everyone we're contributing to, there's going to be more money. If we hold all that value within ourselves, we don't share it, nobody knows about it. See, it's really serving others, solving problems, and delivering that value that really creates money. Some people have all this notion that it takes money to make money. So they think, oh, it's unfair, I don't have money, I can't make money. But it actually takes resourcefulness. Or they think high risk equals high return. These are all kind of concepts I dispel in Killing Sacred Cows. Well, if you believe that, then you're going to put yourself in harm's way by taking more risk than is necessary in the name of hope for a high return, like kind of what I would call the lottery syndrome. Or people are taught they're in it for the long haul. And unfortunately, when most people have misinformation around money, it kind of comes from this construct of live within your means. And so right. living within your means is decent advice. The problem is there's three ways to live within your means, and most people only think about one, which is cutting back. Mm. which is budgeting, sacrificing, yeah. scrimping, saving. And so that's never fun. That's never enjoyable. That's never like dinner topic that most people want to have. And there's really two other ways that are a lot more enjoyable to live within your means. One is to be more efficient. So efficiency could be those four I's I talked about. Um, in the U.S., I'd call it the IRS, obviously, but there's the Canada Revenue Service. Like just overpayment of tax. The second is overpayment of interest. The third is overpayment of insurance costs. The fourth is overpayment on investments. If you can get that money back and plug those leaks, you're going to get further and you can have more money to enjoy life with. Or the third way, which is the most impactful, is to expand your means. Continually mm. seek to deliver more value and reach more people and all of a sudden you're going to have more money in your life. So I don't want to come from a place of restriction and reduction, I want to come from production. And production is really the key, and that's why we have to invest in ourselves to figure out and expose our skill sets, not only to, our, to who we are, but bring that out to the marketplace. Because if you want more financial capital in your life, it's a function of having more knowledge, or what I would call mental capital, right? Mm -hmm. Wisdom, insight, innovation, ingenuity. And when we multiply that by our relationship capital, people, networks, customers, you know, friends, family, that's that bridge of business between mental and relationship capital that drives all the financial capital in the world. So if you have a money problem, it's really a mental or relationship capital problem, which means you're one idea or one relationship away from solving any financial issue that you have. Mm. So most people think about finance as stocks and bonds yeah. and as sacrifice and savings. But I look at money and finance as simply byproduct of value creation and is one useful tool to keep score of how much we're impacting the world that we can actually cash in and utilize the, and benefit from other people as well. And that what that really means is exchange creates wealth. Mm -hmm. And there's not a finite amount of exchange. We can exchange with one another an infinite number of times. So even if there's a finite amount of resources or money, that money can exchange over and over again and actually build more wealth, which dispels the myth of the, the finite pie. So when people think there's a finite pie, they believe in win-lose, zero-sum game. They don't think yeah. in cooperation. They think in competition, and that puts them into scarcity. It destroys brilliance and collaboration and therefore halts their overall wealth. Mm -hmm. So part of money is just understanding personal finance, and that's why we begin there. Yeah. Personal finance. I mean, simple things like car insurance, homeowners, liability, disability, medical, life insurance, you know, corporate structure, yeah. taxes interest, um, loans, like it feels overwhelming because there's a lot of information out there. But if you could just cut to the, the core of it and say, what are the nine things I have to handle to have my foundation? Mm -hmm. Now you have a plan and a map and an awareness. What are nine things I can do to be more safe and to really create these sustainable well, you know, um, structures? And then nine focuses on growth. There's only really 27 points to any true financial plan. And if most people think there's 2,700, it gets overwhelming, and then we just go back to, I'll just work harder, yeah. and that'll be better, and we don't face this thing because it feels like a behemoth, it feels confusing, or it feels boring as hell, or we have embarrassment. Like, embarrassment mm. comes from feeling like we should be further along than we actually are. And that happens for a lot of people, even if they're successful. Because if we compare ourselves to anyone else out there in the world, there's always someone with more. 
Yeah. And there's always someone doing better or at least saying that they have more or saying that they're doing better. Right. And so these are part of the reasons we neglect money is because if we have to face it and confront it, maybe it's worse than we thought. Maybe we feel bad that we didn't know it before and we just don't we just don't want to address it. So or we're just used to talking to financial people that want us to budget and scrimp. So we don't really feel good about that because it makes us, you know, like feel out of control. So there's so many pieces to it. But most of it comes down to scarcity and limiting beliefs. And once we identify that and we can get beyond that, now we have a baseline to start moving forward and progressing. Yeah. And, and you know, Garrett, I, I, I love that your topic in itself is hyper tactical and relevant for people because everybody's dealing with money and finances and you know, people that are watching this and listening to this most likely have gotten triggered at some, you know, uh, going through the list of things like, oh, I've been putting, you know, putting off dealing with that, right? And we had, um, we had the author of The Big Leap, um, Gay Hendricks, on. He talks about the upper limit theory, right? So I love what you talk about in terms of living, kind of increasing your means, right? Because yeah. everything else, when you're operating out of that lack or scarcity, like when you're trying to save off the, you know, whatever, you know, the couple dollars you spend at Starbucks or McDonald's coffee, whatever it is, and you're trying to, you know, do that and save your way to a million dollars, like it doesn't work that way, right? Yeah, it, we don't shrink our way to wealth. Yeah. And if we get caught up on pinching pennies, we miss out on the dollars that are all around us through value creation because mm. scarcity doesn't get us thinking about others or building value. It gets us thinking about what we can scrimp together. And uh, you could become the millionaire next door, but you'll always live a, a poor life yeah. because you won't be enjoying the money. And to me, if you, why have the money if you never utilize it or enjoy it? Yeah. There's a difference between frugality and scarcity. And if people move to scarcity instead of frugality, they usually have a lot of uh, inner conflict. They have a lot of conflict with the outer world, with a spouse, with, you know, family members. They're, they're labeled like, it, look at it, man. They wrote Christmas Carol with Ebenezer Scrooge. And there's some people that might not be as miserly, but shit, they're pretty close. Yeah. Well, it, it, it kind of goes exactly back to what you're saying. Like money is this byproduct of value. So focus on how do you actually create value in the marketplace around you, right? Um, and, and I love that you're mentioning some of these things, you know, between tax, between, you know, how do you save on interest? How do you, you know, what, what are the hidden fees within investments? And so this is just something, and maybe this is just the Canadian version of it. I'm not too sure. But every time I read any type of finance book or anything, it seems a lot predicated, obviously, on the American market, right, in, in the U.S. Is this some of these things same translatable to Canadian? Should Canadians be also looking at, you know, how to lower their tax and how to save on the interest and hidden fees? Um, yeah. is, is that... 100% transferable from just your knowledge of, of, you know, working with Canadians in U.S.? Totally. Where you're going to have a little bit of nuance or difference is obviously health insurance is totally different when yeah. it comes to U.S. versus the, uh, the system set up in Canada. Um, tax structures are a little bit different. But, for example, I was giving a talk in, uh, here in, in uh, Utah, mm -hmm. but there was a Canadian in the room that's a very successful entrepreneur. He saved $100,000 of tax just by using the framework that I shared because the framework is universal. Yeah. How you apply it is different from country to country. But once you understand, like, what is a framework that once you think this way, you can start applying. Yeah. So, so really, yeah, tax situation is different in Canada than the U.S. Um, and, and the health insurance, uh, legal structures is a little bit different. But everything else is almost identical. Mm. Almost identical. Um, there are small nuances on the tax treatment of life insurance. You know, there are small nuances on how uh, other insurances work, but they're very similar. Investments are extraordinarily similar. So, yeah, I mean, this is this is really going to be 90 plus percent that applies on both places. Love it. Love it. Love it. And, and I do want to ask, you know, in terms of, you know, business owners um, that are listening and watching this right now. By the way, if you guys have not gotten, you know, his book, Killing Sacred Crowds, make sure to go grab a copy. And I believe it is Wealth Factory for Facebook, for Twitter. It's WealthFactory.com. Make sure to go actually follow Garrett um, because he's got some amazing tips all around this. Um, and I do want to ask some misconceptions. But before I do, you did say something um, earlier on about focus versus diversification. Yeah. And, and I feel like there's a bit of a misconception around that as well, because we hear it all the time. We need to diversify, 
right? Or at least that, that kind of seems like what the overarching message is. Uh, what, do, what do you mean when you say focus versus diversify? Diversification is a notion on how to manage and mitigate risk that comes from ignorance. When you don't know what's going to work, you diversify so that if one thing goes bad, it's not you're losing everything. The problem with diversification that we rarely hear about is it becomes diversification because now all of a sudden you have more things that can actually go wrong. Right. Less relationship to the outcome of those things, less expertise. And so a lot of people go through that. I believe that it's skipping steps that requires diversification. If you don't skip the first two steps, diversification is not only unnecessary, it's actually harming your performance. So the first step is you build your foundation. Mm. You build a foundation that gets liquidity, that has safety measures would be the second piece. And then you focus your eggs in one basket and watch it like a hawk. That's according to Andrew Carnegie. You only invest in alignment with your investor DNA, your core competencies, your core values, your core drivers, and then you focus in on that and you do all that you can to protect the downside, to add collateral. Like when you get a loan from a bank, that's not diversified for the bank. It's one person, one loan on one piece of real estate. So what do they do? They make you get an appraisal. Mm -hmm. If you don't put enough money down, they charge you private mortgage insurance. They look at your taxes. They look at your credit score. Yeah. They, they intrigue you to do a shorter loan and give you a better interest rate because that lowers the risk. So what they do is they create risk mitigation strategies with the one investment rather than having an array of investments that they don't know or understand or control. And I think especially for entrepreneurs, we prematurely diversify by pulling money out of the business before the business is fully funded, before we have the right people, processes, or technological procedures, mm -hmm. and then we go hand it over to other things and companies and investments that we know nothing about, no control over the outcome, no downside protection, simply because that's what everyone else does. But everyone else doing something doesn't make it right. If 50 million people are doing foolish things, it's still a foolish thing. And so what I want people to do is start thinking critically about how related are they to the investment? Because risk isn't in the investment, it's in the investor. And if you're investing in things you know nothing about and they're outside of your investor DNA, you've added risk to your life. The, de the definition of risk is chance of loss. So if you increase your risk, you increase your chance of loss. And this faulty notion of high risk equals high return is absolutely crap because the people that really know what they're doing, they're not trying to take risk, they're trying to lower risk. And it's risky when we invest in things that we have no connection to. So that's really dissecting that down. Focus instead of diversify, that's what the wealthiest people have done, including Warren Buffett says maybe 20 lifetime investments, right? Mm. It's, it's just, it bothers me, the diversification notion. I guess it's a, a notion for the poor, it's a notion for a way to preserve capital. It's not a notion for investing, though. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think you said, I mean, people really need, if they could just even listen to some of the advice there um, in terms of liquidity, in terms of figuring out their, their what you call the investor DNA. I love that. Um, because it, not... It's it's just because it's you know there, there's a huge you know whether it's real estate or cryptocurrency or stocks like there seems to be all these like different hot topics and everyone sometimes feels like they're missing out if they're not a part of this one thing. So I love that you point that out. Scarcity thinking, you know, it goes back to the fear and greed. I mean, I had I've put my foot down with some of my clients that are getting so wrapped up in cryptocurrency. I'm like, yeah. you're welcome to invest in it with any dollars you can afford to lose. But don't invest a single dollar anywhere until you're economically independent, until you fully funded your business. Mm. Because these speculative things, yes, they have huge upside potential, but you should only invest in speculation that you can afford 100% to lose. Otherwise, you become like the middle class that watch these news reports and read these publications and then they jump into something after it's too late or it's already run up or they don't know what's going on and then they lose it then they have to start over and it takes a huge dent out of their legacy so i'm here to help people preserve and protect their capital not speculate with it if they want to speculate that's fine but not on not on the critical dimes that are required for them to have their foundation and safety handled. For sure, for sure. Um, so for people that are watching this and listening to this, I know for a lot of people in the, in the kind of change maker community, you know, they themselves, they're business owners. Some of them are, you know, solopreneurs. Some of them are are building teams. And you know, we're you know we're a couple years into building the whole thing. What are maybe some critical things that we should maybe take a look at um, because I, I feel like we've gone through so many different misconceptions, right? And we realize a lot of these come from a middle class type of thinking. If someone is entrepreneurial, they're watching this, they're listening to this and they want to kind of 
I guess, take greater control of their finances, of their businesses and what have you. What are some, I guess, some, some components that, you know, that, that they should definitely be taking a look at or taking a second glance at? Build liquidity. I feel like people aren't mm. liquid enough. They don't have enough money to save. We've collapsed the term savings and investment into one like term that's almost a synonym, yeah. but it's not. Yeah. Savings are savings accounts, money markets, checking accounts. It's liquid money that doesn't have risk of going down. Sure, it has inflation risk, but it doesn't have risk of loss of principal. Sure. Somehow people are calling 401k savings plans or RSP savings plans. Those aren't savings plans. Those are retirement vehicles that have massive illiquidity issues and are typically funded by investments like mutual funds. Mm. So all of a sudden people feel like they're saving. They're not saving, they're investing. And here's the difference. When the market goes down, that's usually the biggest time where there's opportunity. If you're in the market and you go, well, if I cash out, now I have a realized loss, you're not liquid. You're not feeling like you can use that for other opportunities, but someone that has that savings, they have an opportunity fund where they can pounce and take advantage of things that are out there. So I feel like people are undercapitalized. They don't have enough emphasis on savings. And rather than budgeting your way there, just pay yourself first. When you take money from the business and pay yourself personally, take a percentage off the top, put it in a separate account, and then build that up. Make sure you have at least six months, but when you get to two years, you're a boss. When you have two years, you've got staying power. You've got opportunity that you can jump on. Anything less than that, I still feel like there's unnecessary risk. And a lot of people talk three or six months, which is great, but I'm not just looking at it from a peace of mind standpoint, or even worse, I hate when they call it an emergency fund. I'm calling it a peace of mind fund because when the cash is there, you have more peace of mind. I'm looking at it from a war chest, an opportunity fund, so that whatever unexpected surprise happens in your life, it doesn't derail or destroy you. Or when that right opportunity comes, you can capitalize on it rather than miss out. Where so much wealth is lost isn't even just the losses people have in their investments. It's the losses they have because they weren't liquid enough to take advantage of the opportunities when they come their way. Yeah, and, and, we'll, and we'll never know. Right, they'll never know what could have been, and and I love that you say that because I, I'm pretty sure I, I I think it was Mark Cuban, um, and I think it was like Entrepreneur Inc. that that was interviewing him, and he said, Mark, you know, you're a billionaire, you're so successful, you're on Shark Tank. What's the best investment strategy? I think that that was the question, and he was like, I'm gonna give you the strategy, but I feel like nobody is gonna listen because he goes, I want you to be in cash. You need liquidity because whenever the market takes a downturn or, or whenever things dip a little bit, you want to be able to have that availability to you um, and, and, yep. and have that cash to actually take action to do something with it. Right. So that is huge because so many different um, entrepreneurs at, at every stage, they they kind of neglect that. And, you know, they're always kind of it's, it's almost like they're, they're, they want to earn more. They want to you know, figure out a way of, you know, creating more revenue and, and they kind of think, you know, for whatever reason that having that liquidity is not going to be as strong. Right. Um, so for people that are maybe, cause you, you mentioned a few of these things in terms of if they're kind of curious of taking a, a deeper look at, you know, their finances and their tax plan, like how do you work with, you know, businesses and, 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 and how does like wealth factory actually work? Is it type of like a, a financial investment type thing? Like just walk us through a little bit of that and that way we can all have yeah. a little more context. We're, we're not fee based or commission based. We're a tuition backed by results and implementation. So people write us a check, mm. full disclosure. That, now to, to work with this, they go to wealthfactory.com forward slash private. They fill out a few questions. And then based upon how they fill out the questions determines who they talk to on our team. And then we can have a conversation about what it looks like to help them. And we typically start with an immersion type program anywhere from one to three days, depending on their situation, where they're in a very small, intimate setting with our team and a few other people. And we're working through where they financially set, where they not set, what's their financial blind spots, what's their economic independence number, what's their cash flow plans, where can we plug leaks? What can they do to scale their business? And how does all this relate to their life? Like that's how we begin. And then based upon if they're a good fit for us and we're a good fit for them, then we engage them on a one-on-one -on -one program. For new businesses, we created a program that is partial one-on-one -on -one and a hybrid of getting some group work done as well so that we could reach more people that we were turning away in the past. That took us like four and a half years to build. Mm. So there's a couple of options there. But um, you know, wealthfactory.com forward slash private is one of the best ways to do it. Um, they can also, if they just want to like get connected on 
a bunch of our resources and thinking, they can go to wealthfactory.com forward slash mega kit. It has my books in there. It has our due diligence tools and cash flow optimization for entrepreneurs. And it just gets you kind of like a bunch of resources. And then every fifth resource tells you how you can engage us or write a check or, or get like some of our newsletters or our video series or one-on-one -on -one sessions. Sure. So wealthfactory.com forward slash mega kit is a, another killer resource. Awesome, awesome. And, and I'll, I'll be sure to kind of link everything down below. Um, you know, Garrett, I, I, I do have a couple last questions for you. And, yeah. you know, the theme of the show overarching in, in the last couple of years has always been this legacy over currency. And, you know, yeah. before I kind of get your opinion on the matter, I mean, you wrote a book literally called What Would the Rockefellers Do? And, and these guys are known for generational wealth. Right. So yeah. without, I guess, giving the whole thing away, I mean, what was some of the things that, I mean, struck you about what families like the Rockefellers do? Right. And, and, and what can we kind of learn, you know, people that are maybe are not born into wealth or not maybe have the same yeah. financial education and ha upbringing, especially if you're born into a family that has such great wealth. What are some of those habits that maybe we can infuse and integrate in, into our lives? A uh, family constitution that governs your trust. Mm. The U.S. Has, oh. you know, when we got a constitution here in the U.S., man, it made a huge difference. Yeah. Uh, and the other countries have adopted them since. And so you create a family constitution that kind of governs it instead of legalese. Because most legalese in estate planning is about dividing, distributing, and it destroys wealth long term. A family constitution helps to protect it, preserve it, and perpetuate it. So that's the first thing. The second thing is developing family retreats. So that you're starting to have conversations around money, legacy, philosophy, and you're looking at your human life value, not just your financial value, and starting to transfer that. And then the third family piece is a family office. You start having a financial team that communicates with one another, that helps protect you, that's part of your due diligence, so that you don't have missing pieces or broken pieces that end up costing people a lot of money. Um, so those three pieces were huge, and then they also integrated using life insurance to replenish the trust. So if there was a downturn in the economy, or if one of the heirs, didn't, they had a business that didn't succeed, that it didn't destroy the trust, the insurance when they died would replenish whatever that was, so it would be there for the next generation. So those three family ideas and the insurance idea, and you know, people can grab uh, what would the Rockefellers do in the wealthfactory.com forward slash mega kit, or they could even text into 44222 and put the word wealthier. So 44222, the word wealthier, and they can actually get a download of that book and start reading it because I have some of my family constitution that I show inside of that book. I show how wealthy families buy their net worth at times rather than even have to build it so they can really kind of advance some things. That's a whole chapter. I talk about why certain financial people hate insurance, yet the Rockefellers enjoyed how they used insurance, and it's a very specific setup and type of insurance because a lot of the people that hate insurance have a good reason to, but there's some you know ways to utilize it in your favor. So those are some ideas inside of that book. It's a, it's a, there's a lot of practicality to that book. If people read it, and it definitely works in Canada and the U.S., so that's really <laughs> it's a it's a little universal. I love that. I've never heard of that. You know, preface it with we don't usually have too many people you know coming on the show diving deep on this exact topic, but family constitutional family retreats and creating an office and family office, a, a pretty much a success team around that. Um, so, um, what, what was the link again? It was wealthfactory.com forward slash mega kit. Right. Yep. Um, and uh, you guys can take a look at that because I know for 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 me personally, it's it's always been one of those topics that you kind of push off because you don't want to deal with it and, and you're overwhelmed by it. There's a lot of terminology you don't know. But more and more, as you think about the legacy and the business that you're building, you want to be able to protect that and be able to kind of give that to the right people and the people that you care about. So um, I think there's huge, huge value in that. So I appreciate you, Garrett, for sharing that. Um, in terms of maybe your own legacy, maybe to kind of switch the tables on you a little bit. Um, how do you think about, like now that you get the opportunity of helping people and business owners kind of preserve their legacy, how does this play into your legacy? Do you ever think about kind of that whole debate of legacy over currency? Obviously, you know, you having so much to do with both ends of it. Um, walk us through a little bit, just your thoughts on, on that theme. I think that in the old days, man, a lot of people spent time with their family. You know, people worked agriculturally, they had farms, their kids worked on the farm, they spent time every day. Now we're in a 
world where people get on flights and they don't see their families for extended periods of time. And, and there's a lot of technology that starts to create a lot of distraction. So to me, legacy really begins with where we put our attention and time. And so I'm looking at how do I build really great traditions with my family, really great rituals and habits that, that connect us. When I went to Italy, you know, Italy may not be in great shape financially as a country, but they're in great shape from a stability, from a family standpoint. They really put their family first. They spend a ton of time with their family. So you don't see the same levels of maybe, at least where I was, I didn't see the levels of addiction and, and I didn't see the rebellion that you see and you didn't see the, the violence that you're seeing right now in the U.S., out there, right? And I really felt it was like, because people were there for each other and they spent a lot of time with each other. And I spent a lot of time with my kids. We played a lot of cards. We swam in the pool. We went to a lot of good meals. We, yeah. we you know, went for walks. And so I really look at legacy with how we choose to spend our time. And now when I came home, I was like, what am I no longer gonna tolerate? I'm not gonna tolerate when people wanna hijack my day because urgency is their way of life. I'm not gonna tolerate people that are constantly dramatic that start infringing upon my peace of mind simply because of their own behaviors and viewpoints on the world. And what that does is help me reclaim that time to spend time with my family, to reconnect with them and consider that legacy isn't just the money that I leave behind, but legacy really has to do with, am I, if my kids, if, if I didn't give my kids any money, could they create money? That's when I know I've done a good job, you know, because the only people really fit to inherit money are the ones that, that don't need it. So I'm just going to reach back here and pull up what would the Rockefellers do because there's a quote from Atlas Shrugged that I start the book with. Mm. And I just really like this quote because it, it kind of describes the whole yeah. thing. Only the man who does not, do not, does not need it is fit to inherit wealth. The man who would make his own fortune no matter where he started. If an heir is equal to his money, it serves him. If not, it destroys him. But you look on and you say that money corrupted him. Did it or did he corrupt his money? That's from Atlas Shrugged, Francis de Anconia speech and I'm like that's where it's at you know like my kids said hey why are you guys flying first class and we're in coach I'm like because you can fly first class when you can pay for it Love you it. know like I can pay yeah, for it yeah. I earned it first class is the thing that you earn um and so I had a conversation with my son just this week about that mm. so Love it. And, and yeah. there's so much truth. And, and I, I can, I just know personally, uh, I think I mentioned earlier, like my, my girlfriend's Italian, like from Italy and the way that their family is even extended family, right? Uncles and aunts and like just how close everyone is and how much they kind of know each other. Um, and, 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 and they're willing to kind of have fun together. You know, whereas yeah, it's a little cool. different being, you know, not just like from North America, but also being from an Asian background. It's just a little different in terms of how families interact. So it's it's so true and interesting what you what you say uh, in terms of making that a priority, you know, you know and, and, and choosing that family time. So um, absolutely awesome. And I'm going to make sure to kind of grab a copy of that book because I want to be able to kind of geek out on some of this stuff. Um, but Garrett, um, for people that, um, I, I know we've already mentioned like wealth factory, uh, wealthfactory.com and, and uh, people can kind of socially follow you on, on Facebook and Twitter. Um, the last question that I have for you really is, you know, the name of the show, it's called the inner change maker. So mm -hmm. is there anything that pops into your mind, any photos, any, any things that pops in your mind when someone says the word change maker? Uh, when I hear inner, I just think meditation, man. Mm. That's what comes to mind. Yeah. You know, inner change maker. Well, it's like you meditate, all of a sudden you create some space for creativity, for groundedness. They show that people that meditate, that a certain part of the brain starts to grow. Um, so... I just highly encourage taking that time to not have the noise of the world and the constant busyness and uh, meditate and that'll make a big difference on how you show up for mm. the world. Well, I love that. And, and I want to take a few seconds to acknowledge you for just coming on the show, for bringing some color, enthusiasm, you know, for a topic that might get overlooked because of how overwhelming it is. Um, and I love, and I love that you bring that flavor to this. So, um, if there is a place that we have not mentioned it, is, is, is that all the, the social medias? Is there a place that people can kind of socially stalk you, like a more personal? Uh, I mean, they could, they could, if they go on my Facebook, I, it's just a personal Facebook, yeah. so it's maxed out. And for me to actually make a post is somewhat of a miracle. <laughs> um, 
But if they go to Wealth Factory's Facebook yeah. page, then there will actually be some resources and Sweet. stuff worthwhile. So. Sweet. And 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 uh, so appreciate you for being here, Garrett. Um, and for the people that are watching and 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 listening to this, we really really hope that you are actually able to take some of these tips and hacks and apply that, integrate that, whether you're Canadian or American. Right. And, and hopefully take a little deeper dive in being able to create that for your family and for the people. It'll around work you. as long as you're a human being. So it's really good for human beings. Yeah. As, as long as you are a human being on planet Earth, it's going to work. Yeah. 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 All, right. All right, guys. Thanks we'll talk to you guys me. next week. Bye.